Just recently, Silicon Valley Bank's failure, along with that of uh, Signature's failure uh, as a bank, uh, led so many people to fear that this was some contagion-like bank failure, weakness in the banking system that would lead to widespread failure and downside problems that would be significant. Uh, Moody's, for example, rating agency, one of the three big rating agencies, uh, downgraded the entire banking segment, which in my opinion was an extraordinarily moody thing to do. Most of these rating agencies, and Moody's in particular, just tend to go with the crowd as sentiment shifts, and it was a statement about sentiment, in my opinion. But first, Silicon Valley Bank's problems were very unique and mostly misunderstood. Most of the public commentary about Silicon Valley Bank has been that which is somewhat true, that they, in the portfolio that a bank normally uses to be able to liquidate quickly to cover withdrawals that are unusually large on a given day, the so-called available for sale portfolio. We're using long dated bonds that when long-term interest rates went up tied to earlier 2023 inflation fears, fell in price and made them have to take unrealized losses bigger than what you'd like to see, and they couldn't cover all the incoming requests for withdrawals. And well, that's true, it's really kind of a misnomer because the real problem was they got all these requests for withdrawal. And why? Because what's really unique about Silicon Valley Bank, unlike almost any bank in America, not any bank, but almost any bank, is that it had an extraordinary concentration in same type depositors. Those who then ended up withdrawing the money were like peas in pods. They were overwhelmingly and unusually so compared to any part of American banking. Venture capital firms, the venture capital firms, portfolio companies, the employees of both, families and friends of both. And when on Wednesday and Thursday, VC firms started phoning their portfolio companies and demanding that they yank the money out of Silicon Valley Bank, quote, before others do, that created an extraordinary run on the bank. Different than, let's say, some other banks that are similar sized, but that have diverse portfolios of donors. Let me give you an example. Overlapping in the same geography with a, almost exactly the same size and very similar balance sheet was First Republic Bank. But it has a very, in that same geography, overlapping geography, it's not perfectly so, but hugely so, Silicon Valley, Southern California, a little bit in New York, tied to wherever VCs are, but not the VC depositor base. They withstood requests as other family, friends, and what have you demanded to take money out easily because of the very diverse customer base, so they didn't all do it at once. Now, the other thing about Silicon Valley Bank that created fear, which is a false fear, was the media fanning the false notion that's also kind of correct, but basically false, that this was the second biggest bank failure ever, and that the New York bank signature that failed with a concentration in crypto stuff was the third biggest, both failing within days of each other, Friday and Sunday. That's right in one unimportant way. If you take Silicon Valley Bank, about twice as big as the other, it had a little over 200 billion of deposits. And that's how you'd measure that, and that's what was cited. If you take that $200 billion and compare it to the size of the total US economy, versus the size of banks that have failed before, tied to the size of the US economy then, then Silicon Valley Bank wasn't even close to the biggest bank failure ever. Let me give you an example of that. 
1931 at the Great Depression's building, the New York-based Bank of the United States, not a federal entity, just a commercial bank with that name, failed. It was the largest bank failure of 1931. Silicon Valley Bank, with $211 billion, developed the size of the U.S. economy in 2023, is only, to a rounding error, 4% as big as Bank of U.S. was in 1931 relative to the size of the U.S. economy then. Even though, and this is a little hard for people to get their heads around, but it's true, Bank of the U.S. then was only a little over $200 million in deposit. The difference is almost 100 years of both inflation and U.S. economy growing, about 2,500%. That phenomena, which people don't take into account, says that banks then were, I mean, that bank in particular, hugely more important to the economy. Its bank failure was hugely more significant, detrimental to America. If you take the 1984 Continental Illinois bank failure, it would have been bigger than Signature and Silicon Valley Bank together adjusted that way, relative to the size of the economy, and didn't even cause a recession, didn't cause a bear market, didn't cause any contagion, didn't cause other banks to fail. What I'm wanting you to see is those two things. Then the third one, which I think is really the killer item, is that the way you basically measure the solvency of a bank is its loans in total compared to the size of its deposits. Make sense? because it's the depositors that'll pull the money out. And if you've got plenty of government bonds, mortgages, and other assets relative to deposits that might get pulled out, you can cover the deposits readily. And that's always been what banking's been all about. Fundamentally, when we look at all banks in America today, small banks' balance sheets are a little bit worse in that way than big banks. Big banks after 2007, 8, 9 were forced by the Fed, particularly in the aftermath of the Dodd-Frank legislation, to beef up their balance sheets. And the Fed has focused on forcing the big banks, the so-called too-big-to-fail banks, to make sure their balance sheets were super strong and stronger than ever. But the banking system as a whole, I'm going to tell you, based on loans to deposits, is not as strong as it's ever been but almost as strong as it's ever been in my over 50 year professional career. Almost stronger than it's ever been in my septuagenarian life. The fact is, if you just look at a chart of that function, it keeps improving and isn't quite as high as it was just a little while ago, but is higher than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and 70 years ago which tells you that the banking system is actually in pretty darn good shape, which is one of the reasons why the fears of contagion and downgrading and worrying about the banks and thinking Silicon Valley Bank might fail, so maybe this one would or that one would or the other one would, isn't really right on. Now, an another point to this that I'd like you to see is, of course, there might be some other banks that fail. They would be smaller ones. The same principle would apply that it wouldn't spread. It's not a systemic problem of importance. And therefore, fear of a false factor, which this fear of bank contagion is a false factor, is always a bullish feature. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you found it interesting. Subscribe to the Fisher Investment YouTube channel if you like what you've seen. Click the bell to be notified as soon as we publish new videos.